Good afternoon. My name is Tom Nastic. I'm a public program producer here at the National Archives in Washington, DC. It's my pleasure to welcome you all here today to the William G. McGowan Theater, and to also welcome uh, those watching us on the National Archives YouTube channel. Today, our series of new time author lecture and book signings continues with The Taming of Free Speech, America's Civil Liberties Compromise with our guest, Laura Weinrib. This program is presented in conjunction with the exhibit Amending America, now on display through September 4th, 2017, two floors up in our Lawrence F. O'Brien Gallery. Only 27 times out of more than 11,000 proposals have Americans reached consensus to amend the Constitution. Amending America reveals the stories behind why some proposed amendments successfully became part of the Constitution, while others failed to gain enough support. Before we get to today's program, I'd like to tell you about two upcoming programs that will take place in this theater. On Thursday, September 29th at 7.30 p.m., uh, the National Archives joins with the Constitutional Accountability Center and the National Park Service to prevent, present a panel discussion, the 14th Amendment, the National Park Service, and America's Second Founding. To celebrate the 150th anniversary of the passage of the 14th Amendment, we look at how the amendment defines U.S. citizenship, its connection to America's Second Founding, the passage of the Reconstruction Amendments, and the interpretation of these topics at National Park Service sites. And then on Thursday, October 4th at 7 p.m., we will present a screening and discussion of a new documentary film, Equal Means Equal. Through real-life stories and precedent-setting legal cases, the film looks at how women are treated in the United States today and presents a compelling and persuasive argument for the urgency of ratifying the Equal Rights Amendment. Following the film screening will be a discussion with Kamala Lopez, director of Equal Means Equal. To find out more about these and other programs, exhibits, and events at the National Archives, please consult our monthly calendar of events. There are copies outside the theater, and it's also available online at our website, www.archives.gov. Laura Weinrib is a 2003 graduate of Harvard Law School. She completed a PhD in history at Princeton University in 2011. In 2000, she received an AB in literature and an AM in comparative literature from Harvard University. After law school, she clerked for Judge Thomas L. Ambro of the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. From 2009 to 2010, she was a Samuel I. Golieb Fellow at Legal History at the New York University School of Law. Her teaching and research interests include American legal history, civil liberties, constitutional law, labor law, and family law. After her talk and Q&A, Dr. Weinrib will be signing copies of her book, One Level Up, outside the archive store. Please welcome Laura Weinrib to the National Archives. Thanks very much. Um, I'm really delighted uh, to be here today, and I very much appreciate the opportunity to talk to you uh, about my book. Uh, it's especially a pleasure uh, to talk about this in conjunction with the exhibit on Amending America, because uh, I hope that what I talk about today will help us to rethink what it means uh, to amend the Constitution uh, and uh, how and when uh, that might occur. Um, I want to start us off today by reflecting on a claim uh, that we've heard often in the last few years from both scholars and politicians, uh, which typically takes something like the following form. So as you can see, it starts with Citizens United, which is being used uh, as shorthand today for the idea that corporations have First Amendment rights. And it's not just about campaign finance regulation, uh, which is what the case actually involved. Uh, rather, Citizens United has come to stand for the idea that the First Amendment protects businesses uh, in a wide variety of contexts. So here's uh, the second part of the claim, uh, namely the idea that, that the First Amendment protects businesses uh, as much as it does you and me uh, is a new one. And what's more, it's a perversion of our constitutional values. Uh, whatever the First Amendment was meant to do, uh, the argument goes, uh, it wasn't this. 
And that brings us uh, to the last part. Uh, the court used to be a champion of the little guy. Now it's gone off the rails uh, and started protecting the rich and powerful instead. Now, needless to say, this is not a marginal view. Um, as you can see, this version was articulated in a recent uh, campaign speech by Hillary Clinton. Uh, and Clinton is part of a much bigger chorus. The documents and uh, uh, records I discovered in researching uh, my book make it clear that claims of this nature have the history wrong. Uh, but before I tell you why, I want to say a word about where they come from uh, and what they're meant to capture. So these claims are rooted uh, in what we might call the golden age of the First Amendment. The years uh, from the Second World War until the Rehnquist Court, when uh, the Warren Court celebrated unfettered expression and steadily expanded the First Amendment's reach. And in an era when uh, other state and federal actors regularly targeted agitators, the judiciary was comparatively friendly uh, to uh, the rights of dissenters. Uh, the celebrated cases of this period gave us the iconic First Amendment protagonists of the 20th century, uh, socialist soapbox orators, civil rights marchers, and anti-war protesters. Then, uh, sometime in the 1980s uh, or 1990s, those First Amendment pioneers began to fade from view, and a new generation took their place. So instead of, uh, say, the NAACP, uh, the First Amendment claimants started to go by names like uh, Central Hudson Gas and Electric Corporation or First National Bank of Boston. In the past few years, uh, researchers have documented and analyzed this transition, and the empirical evidence suggests that half of First Amendment victories now go to business corporations and trade groups challenging regulatory interventions. Scholars have uh, dubbed this transformation the Lochnerization of the First Amendment on the theory that businesses are using the First Amendment to do the work that liberty of contract uh, did in cases like Lochner v. New York, uh, the notorious 1905 decision invalidating a New York maximum hour law for bakers. During the early 20th century, uh, the United States Supreme Court and its uh, state counterparts used the principle of liberty of contract, uh, which purportedly was contained within uh, the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment, to strike down a lot of progressive legislation, including minimum wage laws, uh, maximum hours law, workers' compensation. Uh, and the idea behind the Lochnerization of the First Amendment is that the First Amendment today, like liberty of contract during the so-called Lochner era, is being used to dismantle burdensome regulatory regimes. Now, many academics and cultural commentators have criticized the court's use of the First Amendment to invalidate legislative and uh, administrative efforts to temper what they see as uh, corporate dominance. Others have celebrated the same trend uh, as a desirable corrective to the earlier decisions, or at least a natural extension of their reasoning. But virtually all of them agree that the court's direction is new. What I want to do today is to challenge that assumption. And I'm going to do that by moving us back a bit further in time from the Warren Court, from that golden age of the First Amendment, uh, to the early 20th century. And I'm going to suggest that the Lochnerization of the First Amendment began a very long time ago. Uh, in fact, it began almost the instant that Lochner itself was put to rest. It was embedded in the First Amendment at the moment that the so-called New Deal settlement was struck. And that, I think, has some real implications as we debate the future of the First Amendment uh, as well. So my lecture today is going to proceed in three parts. Uh, first, I want to present you with a puzzle about the relationship between the courts and the First Amendment, which has everything to do with the legacy of Lochner v. New York. 
I'm going to give you the standard account of how the modern uh, First Amendment emerged and explain why that standard account is inadequate. Then, uh, to better answer our puzzle, I will argue in turn that the roots of the modern First Amendment uh, are both more radical and more conservative uh, than historians have previously understood. So with that, uh, the standard account. I should start by saying what I mean by the modern First Amendment. Uh, namely, uh, the principle that the Constitution prohibits government officials from punishing individuals for the vast majority of their speech, and that the judiciary, the courts, are charged with enforcing that right and with ensuring that the political branches do not overstep their authority. So why the emphasis on modern? Um, the words on the screen uh, obviously are hardly new by American standards. What we now call the First Amendment uh, was ratified 225 years ago in December 1791. But as many of you will know, there was no real constitutional commitment to expressive freedom uh, before the First World War. Now, as you can see, the amendment begins with the words, Congress shall make no law. Uh, until the 1920s, it was not considered binding on the states. And even with respect to federal laws, courts never really intervened with official suppression. It's not the case, though, that everyone thought censorship and suppression was a terrific idea. Uh, debates over free expression flared up periodically in the 19th uh, and uh, early 20th centuries, albeit often in forms that are unfamiliar uh, today. I want to draw your attention to one such debate uh, in the early 1910s, at the height uh, of what's typically called the Progressive Era. The Progressive Era was a time of rapid social and intellectual transformation. And a lot of ideas that had seemed implausible or heretical at the end of the 19th uh, century seemed mainstream by the beginning of the First World War. Progressives understood that social and scientific progress required open discussion of ideas. And yet, most of them did not think that constitutionalism was the way to achieve that openness. Instead, uh, they urged legislators and executive actors to refrain from criminalizing dissent uh, or from prosecuting dissenters. That is, they trusted in a strong state and they sought solutions in the political branches, not in the courts. In fact, the judiciary was the last institution they would have trusted to protect free speech. Most progressives shared a deep distrust of the federal judiciary and a deep aversion to constitutional rights-based claims. And the reason for that distrust is the Lochner-style reasoning I described earlier with its valorization of property rights and liberty of contract. The court exercised what we now refer to as judicial review, uh, what was then uh, called the power to enforce constitutional limitations. Uh, to strike down many of the most celebrated progressive reform initiatives uh, of the progressive era, including minimum wage laws, workplace safety laws, uh, and workers' compensation. And progressives saw all this as a big problem for social welfare. Uh, they were so opposed to judicial review of legislation that, in fact, they tried to abolish it altogether. During the 1910s, progressives proposed, and in some cases uh, passed, uh, a wide range of measures limiting the power of the courts to strike down statutes. Uh, and just to give you a sense of how mainstream this was, even Teddy Roosevelt supported uh, what he referred to as the recall of judicial decisions. Uh, and he considered it, uh, and I'm quoting here, absolutely necessary for the people themselves to take control of the interpretation of the Constitution. Well, all of this came to a head during World War I, uh, when government actors and vigilantes worked together to enforce patriotism and conformity and to quash dissent. 
uh, in what would become a foundational text for the modern uh, First Amendment, freedom of speech in wartime, uh, a law professor named Zachariah Chafee Jr. described an, quote, a, an unprecedented extension of the business of war over the whole nation. Public officials and ordinary Americans denounced all criticism of the war as a threat to public safety. And there were thousands of prosecutions uh, which continued even after the war ended. Uh, many public figures, including the socialist presidential candidate, uh, Eugene V. Debs, ended up in prison for opposing conscription or for opposing American intervention in the war. And neither courts nor government officials stood in the way. I've told you that uh, until World War I, the First Amendment as we know it, that is as a judicially enforceable check on state uh, suppression of speech, simply did not exist. Uh, during the war, almost no one thought that the First Amendment was uh, an obstacle to the prosecution of anti-war dissenters. In fact, even the scholars and judges who were most anxious about the repression were really hesitant to solve the problem through judicial enforcement of the First Amendment because they were so deeply suspicious of judicial review. Now you may be familiar with the traditional story of how that changed, which goes something like this. The wartime repression was so bad that a few pioneering progressives saw the light. So Zechariah Chafee squared the First Amendment with the progressive aversion to individual rights by identifying what he called a social interest in the attainment of truth uh, that would guide public policy. And two celebrated Supreme Court justices, uh, Justices uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. and Justice Louis Brandeis, began to write stirring dissents in decisions upholding the convictions uh, of anti-war speakers. Justice Holmes emphasized the need for what he called a free trade in ideas, that is a marketplace of ideas in which the best ideas would inevitably prevail. And Justice Brandeis emphasized the democratic value of free expression, its connection to the deliberative process. Their reasoning, uh, this story goes, was so persuasive, so obviously right, that they eventually persuaded their fellow justices. But there are a couple of problems with this neat little story uh, that historians and constitutional law scholars have been unable to resolve. So the first is about timing. For more than a decade, uh, these progressive theorists and academics were in a tiny minority. If Holmes and Brandeis were so persuasive, why did it take such a long time for the Supreme Court to start actually striking down laws as incursions on the First Amendment? And why did the wayward justices finally come on board? Second, uh, and relatedly, how did the progressives come to trust in the courts as the appropriate institution to enforce free speech? Throughout the 1920s, esteemed progressive outlets like the New Republic declared that the legislatures, not the courts, were properly tasked with policing the First Amendment, and that civil liberties groups should be seeking the repeal of unjust laws, not their invalidation in the courts. Whether and how progressives eventually embrace the Warren Court version of the First Amendment is the puzzle uh, that I'm going to turn to now. So we've arrived uh, in part two, the radical roots of the First Amendment. And the protagonists of this act are not the progressive theorists and judges we ordinarily associate with the First Amendment in the interwar period, but rather a group of lawyers and activists. In particular, I'm going to be focusing on the early leadership of the American Civil Liberties Union. It was the ACLU's organizational precursor uh, that uh, unsuccessfully litigated many of the best known First Amendment cases of the First World War. But what's most important about the ACLU's for to, ACLU for today's purposes is not its wartime activities on behalf of dissenters, um, but rather its staunch commitment to a radical wing of the, uh, of the American labor movement. And as the ACLU's founding documents forthrightly explained, 
The very purpose of the ACLU was to serve as what they called a frank partisan of labor. Now let me start by clarifying that organized labor disliked the courts just as much as progressives did. Uh, during the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the courts relied on the same principles at stake in Lochner-style cases to issue injunctions against strike activity, uh, the so-called labor injunction. Uh, these cases emphasize the property rights of employers as well as the individual autonomy of workers who did not want to be a part of unions. Courts routinely issued injunctions based on nothing more than a claim from an employer that a strike was interfering with its right to maintain production uh, and that it would damage the employer's business. Without hearing testimony, the court would enjoin any further picketing and anyone who disregarded the injunction faced huge fines as well as prison terms. As you might imagine, this had a profoundly detrimental effect on labor organizing. So, like their progressive allies, labor leaders hated the courts. What differentiated the two camps uh, was that many uh, labor leaders hated the state, too. Um, police officers and state and national troops typically intervened on behalf of employers uh, in labor disputes, often arresting or uh, even killing striking workers. And for the most part, organized labor regarded state and federal officials as tools of industry. Okay, so to oversimplify, the defining feature of the ACLU as compared with progressive advocates of free speech like Zechariah Chafee and Justices Brandeis and Holmes is that the organization's early leaders disliked the state even more than they disliked the courts. And they were willing to use the courts to check state power. The, the founders would have preferred to rely on grassroots agitation uh, and direct action, uh, but they eventually resigned themselves, uh, and I'm quoting here, to the fact that the middle class mind works legalistically, and that whenever rights are violated, the first thing they want to do is get a lawyer and go to court. So if, if restraining uh, state power meant invoking judicial process, the ACLU was willing to make that bargain. Now I should pause here to say that the ACLU's distaste for the state does warrant uh, some explaining oh well, as well. Uh, the American Union Against Militarism, from which the ACLU splintered, was founded by some of the best known progressive reformers, people like Crystal Eastman, Jane Addams, Florence Kelly, Paul Kellogg. Um, these are the people who drafted and helped to pass some of the classic progressive reforms from workers' compensation to minimum wage. But by the time the ACLU was reorganized uh, under its modern title in 1920, these progressives had either modified their confidence in the state or in many cases had parted ways with the organization. Uh, I can't give you uh, the full account of the ACLU's early origins today, but I will say that a key player uh, in uh, the organization's development was one of its co-founders, uh, a man named Roger Baldwin. And like other social workers and reformers within the AUAM, uh, Baldwin began his career as a progressive uh, reformer. But by the end of World War I, he was a member of a deeply anti-statist labor organization, the Industrial Workers of the World, uh, and he had entangled his organization in defending the IWW uh, against prosecution. Um, he also uh, took his commitment to uh, opposition to the state very seriously uh, across a wide variety of domains. In fact, he went to jail as a conscientious objector to the draft. And when he came out, he told reporters that he would never vote again uh, or serve on a jury because the state inevitably served the interests of capital. Now, as jarring as this sounds from today's perspective, Baldwin was not alone. There were a number of people within the early ACLU who more or less shared his views. Okay, so how did the radical labor aspirations of uh, the ACLU's founders work their way into the organization's agenda? 
this is where things get really interesting. Uh, I want to emphasize that the vision of free speech espoused by the early ACLU is not the one that we hear about when we speak today about civil liberties in the interwar period. Now, to be sure, the early ACLU invoked and even pioneered the now standard defenses of free speech. Uh, that open debate uh, advances democratic legitimacy, encourages political participation, produces better policies, and serves to channel dissent into peaceful rather than violent outlets. They said all of those things. But what the ACLU was after was not primarily the model of uh, free speech that's familiar today, the freedom of leafleters uh, and soapbox speakers to propagate unpopular ideas. The ACLU had in mind something much more dramatic, which is now almost entirely outside the domain of the First Amendment. What they wanted to protect was something they called the right of agitation a right to secure fundamental social and economic change through economic weapons without state interference. And what they described as falling within this right of agitation was an absolute right to picket, boycott, and strike. Now, for those of you who are rusty on your early labor movement tactics, uh, let me just give you a sense of what First Amendment protection for this kind of activity would have meant. Uh, let's say you have a small local manufacturer in Kentucky uh, that's managing to undersell unionized competitors by paying less than union pay scale. Maybe the employees are uh, satisfied with the situation because uh, the local cost of living is low and everyone knows that lower wages are the only way the local business can stay afloat. So the union approaches the employees, it tries to organize them, but they say, no, we're not interested. Now today, that's the end of the matter. Workplace democracy has come to mean that local employees get to decide. But the tools of secondary activity, which are unlawful now, just as they were uh, during this period, would give the union another option. If union density is strong and there's coordination between unions in different areas and different industries, the union can go to that Kentucky manufacturer's suppliers and distributors, let's say their unionized businesses in Michigan, and call those businesses' employees out on strike so that the suppliers and distributors have no choice except to sever ties with the manufacturer. That's the secondary strike, okay? It can also forbid union members from purchasing the products of any business that continues its relationship with the manufacturer. That's the secondary boycott. And the union can enforce those policies by threatening to expel from the union anyone who fails to comply, anyone who buys the product or crosses a picket line. Now let's say that the union at one of those suppliers has a closed shop agreement with the employer, meaning that the supplier ha has agreed to employ only members of the union in good standing. Now that's illegal today. Uh, but it wasn't uncommon in the early uh, 20th century. So now you're in a situation where you've called a secondary strike in Michigan over a labor dispute with a non-union company in Kentucky, and those Michigan workers whose employer has some sort of relationship with the Kentucky manufacturer has no choice except to go out on strike or risk losing their jobs. Now, needless to say, this was powerful stuff. Uh, courts almost uniformly enjoined it. They understood how powerful uh, it was. And we have to understand that this, not socialist leaflets, is what the ACLU wanted the First Amendment to protect. This was about keeping police officers from breaking up picket lines and from arresting union officials. All right, I can't really do justice today to the story of civil liberties during the 1920s, but suffice it to say that the right of agitation was not the kind of program that was likely to get much buy-in from mainstream progressives, let alone from conservatives. So over time, 
the ACLU hit upon some more subtle long-term strategies. It expanded its operations into areas like academic freedom, artistic expression, sex education, areas uh, where it could get broad-based consensus. And by challenging procedural irregularities and factual determinations, rather than pushing uh, aggressive First Amendment claims, it began to achieve some small victories in the court, all the while uh, saying in its private correspondence and memoranda that what it was really after was this more radical stuff. Um, I think this approach is best captured by a memorandum about the so-called Scopes Monkey Trial, uh, probably the ACLU's best known case of the 1920. Uh, when the ACLU launched the case, Roger Baldwin told the organization that it was a chance to get liberals and progressives involved in civil liberties uh, without, as he put it, fearing contamination with the defense of Reds. Okay, so we're going to fast forward now to the 1930s and the election of President Franklin D. Roosevelt, uh, which presented a fundamental challenge for the ACLU's vision of civil liberties. New Deal efforts to regulate labor relations introduced a strong role for the state in brokering disputes between workers and their employers. And this was a substantial departure from labor's long-standing skepticism uh, towards state involvement, which I've already explained. Uh, and the core ACLU leadership didn't like it. Uh, Roger Baldwin said over and over again that administrative intervention would undermine labor's cause. And he wrote to Senator Robert Wagner in opposition to the National Labor Relations Act, or, or Wagner Act. At the beginning of the decade, the, the ACLU had actually helped to draft and pass the Norris LaGuardia Act. That was a statute that prohibited federal courts from enjoining strike activity. And Baldwin was worried that uh, government involvement, that bringing a government agency in uh, in the form of the Wagner Act would inevitably lead to backtracking from that position of keeping the state out of strikes. And the debate within the ACLU over New Deal labor law is really fascinating because uh, it reveals the extent to which the old commitment to the right of agitation, to this revolutionary right to restructure uh, the economy through collective power was transforming. Many of the organization's new members and allies, those people that the ACLU had brought in over the course of the 1920s, um, defended the rights to picket and boycott only insofar as they communicated workers' views, uh, like any other political activity. And on this new understanding, state intervention in economic and labor relations was fine, as long as it didn't impede the expression of ideas. But even more than this disagreement about state power, what I want to do today is draw your attention to a related debate within the civil liberties movement about the role of the courts. Because as it happened, the New Deal presented an opportunity on that front as well. During the early 1930s, as Congress began to experiment with bold new projects to mitigate the effects of the Great Depression, the Supreme Court continued its practice of striking down social and economic legislation. In fact, it struck down some of the New Deal's most important programs. Uh, and by all accounts, the Wagner Act uh, was on the chopping block. By early 1937, liberals were infuriated. And as in the early 1910s, there was substantial public will for court curbing legislation. Eliminating the power of judicial review would mean that Congress could pass, say, minimum wage uh, legislation without worrying that the court would strike it down as unconstitutional. But most contemporaries assumed it would mean something else, too. It would remove the court from the business of enforcing the First Amendment, an issue that the ACLU had been pushing, of course, since the mid-1920s. And by the same token, preserving a role for the court in enforcing civil liberties would necessarily legitimate the court's property rights decisions. This sentiment was expressed in a pamphlet circulated by the fledgling National Lawyers Guild. Uh, I'm quoting here, judicial protection for civil liberties 
by means of the power to invalidate laws cannot be separated from judicial protection for the selfish interests of large property. Now, by this time, the ACLU had become an established and important uh, liberal group, and it could not avoid uh, weighing in. So it polled a number of lawyers and public figures and issued a report on uh, uh, how far the court has been a defender of civil liberties. And the report evaluated the court's record in civil, liberty cases, civil liberties cases since the 19th century. What it concluded was that the court had, quote, more often failed to protect the Bill of Rights than preserve it. Uh, it concluded that the court was much more likely to uphold property rights than personal rights, like civil liberties. Um, but at the same time, the report acknowledged that the court was gradually expanding the scope of the First Amendment. And it suggested that the power of judicial reviews might be used effectively to safeguard the rights of political and racial minorities. Now, believe it or not, this is about as enthusiastic as any liberal group got in the 1930s when it came to judicial review, to judicial enforcement of the First Amendment. For the most part, the ACLU's New Deal allies were happy to limit the power of the courts, whatever that might have meant for judicial enforcement of the First Amendment. The consensus among progressives was that rescuing the country from the poverty and inequality inflicted by the Great Depression had to come first, and that preserving judicial review would stand in the way. That's what Wisconsin Senator Robert La Follette Jr. had in mind when he argued, quote, that no kind of legal guarantee has ever been able to protect minorities from the hatreds and intolerances let loose when an economic system breaks down, no doubt looking overseas in this moment. Okay, so why didn't court curbing legislation pass? Uh, public figures were floating everything from jurisdiction stripping measures to constitutional amendments abolishing judicial review. There was a lot of momentum for some of the more moderate proposals. Uh, I want to suggest that the answer has a lot to do with the civil liberties movement, but not in the way that one might expect. Which brings us to part three, the conservative roots of the First Amendment. Until the mid-1930s, conservatives had relatively little to say about the First Amendment. Uh, free speech was often included in a, a sort of laundry list of liberties that courts were meant to protect from popular majorities. But liberty of contract uh, tended to get much higher billing. And when it came to actual First Amendment challenges by radical defendants in court, uh, conservative commentators almost always came out on the side of conviction of public order. During the New Deal, however, conservatives awoke to the appeal of a strong Bill of Rights. And the story here is basically the flip side of what I've said about liberal ambivalence uh, toward judicial enforcement of the First Amendment. As liberals' attacks on judicial review became stronger and more plausible, conservatives were casting about for a cause that would rehabilitate the judicial reputation, and they found it in civil liberties. The real turning point came in the spring of 1937 when President Roosevelt announced his own solution to the problem of an unresponsive court, his so-called court packing plan which would have enabled him to appoint up to six additional justices to the United States Supreme Court. And conservative groups, uh, ranging from the US Chamber of Commerce and the National Association of Manufacturers to the American Liberty League, quickly denounced the plan. And one of the most vocal critics was the American Bar Association, uh, which was uh, quite conservative at the time. Uh, and in fact, the ABA mobilized a massive publicity campaign against the bill. Um, and so a committee uh, gathered to brainstorm potential uh, lines of attack. And uh, its, quote, best idea was to develop a series of radio broadcasts featuring, quote, famous cases in which personal rights have been upheld by the Supreme Court. I should say there weren't very many of them at the time. And the ACLU had brought almost all of them against conservative opposition. But now uh, we get this promoting of these same uh, few decisions by the ABA. 
Now, as events unfolded, court curbing legislation never ended up going through. Uh, perhaps the ABA's appeal to civil liberties is part of uh, the reason. Of course, the more significant reason was that it lost its urgency. Uh, in the spring of 1937, the Supreme Court began to uphold New Deal legislation, beginning with the state minimum wage law and quickly proceeding to the Wagner Act. Uh, you may have heard this referred to as the switch in time that saved nine. But the defeat of the court packing plan didn't spell the end of conservative support for civil liberties. Lawyers were worried that one anti-New Deal decision, one backtracking from that switch in time, uh, could revive the assault on the court. The ABA soon launched a public relations program to improve the image of lawyers and judges. And its solution was to create a committee on the Bill of Rights that would reclaim civil liberties as a conservative issue. In fact, the committee's first chair, a prominent uh, Wall Street attorney named uh, Grenville Clark, gave a speech entitled Conservatism and Civil Liberty in June 1938. Uh, in which he complained, quote, that the active defense of civil liberty has been allowed to drift very largely into the hands of elements of the left. Uh, and he emphasized that the ACLU, notwithstanding uh, the admittedly radical views of much of its leadership, uh, deserved credit for defending unpopular causes. But what he said was that by cornering the field of civil liberties so completely, the organization had created quote, the public impression that the active defense of civil liberties is not a matter of primary concern of those uh, of more moderate views. What he was suggesting was that civil liberties uh, might have been defended more vigorously by conservatives if the ACLU had not so strongly tainted uh, the cause with the stamp of radicalism. Okay, as I've mentioned, uh, when conservatives first took up the civil liberties cause, cause uh, they anticipated that the court's uh, protection of free speech would accompany and legitimate its property rights cases, not replace them. So I should say something here about the so-called constitutional revolution. Apologies for all the text uh, up here. Um, but the New Deal transformation in constitutional law is often captured with the shorthand Caroline Products footnote four. Um, and in that famous footnote, which you uh, see here, the court made clear that it would defer to Congress on economic regulation but signaled that it would be more rigorous in its review of cases involving free speech or racial minorities. So the constitutional revolution, uh, which has also been dubbed the New Deal settlement or the bifurcated uh, review process, is conventionally understood to contain two distinct but interconnected parts. First, a relaxation of structural constraints on Congress's uh, control over the economy, and second, an invigoration of constitutional protections for racial and ethnic minorities, along with free speech. And the latter part is said to ensure the democratic legitimacy of the former. The idea is that judicial deference to the outcomes of majoritarian uh, democratic processes requires robust debate with ample protection for minority interests as state policy is formulated and enacted. Now, however sensible that sounds, few contemporaries understood judicial review as susceptible to decoupling in this way. On the contrary, most New Dealers assumed that judicial review came as a package, and that in the absence of constitutional amendment, expansion of the First and Fourteenth Amendment to protect personal rights would have the inevitable effect of buttressing the court's economic due process cases as well. The court's spring 1937 decisions changed all that. Uh, and in the new legal landscape, the conservative strategy quickly morphed. Most conservatives cast uh, the court's decision upholding New Deal legislation against constitutional challenges as basically a betrayal of their deepest uh, conviction. They were intensely critical of those cases. There was no question that they would have revived Lochner-style substantive due process, liberty of contract, property rights, uh, if uh, they could have.
But as it became increasingly apparent that doing so was not in the cards, they quickly discovered the power of the First Amendment, not just as a legitimating uh, factor for the judiciary, but as an independent check on government authority. As the ABA's president explained uh, in announcing uh, that new Committee on the Bill of Rights, uh, a strong First Amendment might prevent the trampling of, quote, well-worn shoes, but it would also come into play, quote, when the crushed toes were encased in patent leather footwear of the wealthy, or the rights denied or the privacy invaded were those of the business corporation. Okay, with an endorsement like that, business groups came on board too. Like the bar, American industry was facing a formidable public relations problem, and as the New Deal drew to a close, the National Association of Manufacturers launched its own uh, PR program to, quote, link free enterprise in the public consciousness with free speech, free press, and free religion, warning that if any one of those components were weakened, quote, the whole structure of our freedom will collapse. Meanwhile, the US Chamber of Commerce highlighted the potential benefits of constitutional protection for commercial speech. And in June 1941, the keynote speaker uh, admonished the chamber's annual meeting to uphold, quote, the rights of the individual and of the minority with the hope that doing so will pave the way to the right to work, which he considered, quote, the first right of all. Okay, so I'm short on time, so I have to leave a fuller account of how this transformation played out uh, to the book, but I'll just preview a couple of highlights. So first, in controversies over the First Amendment, uh, uh, over the, the rights of businesses uh, and corporations uh, under the First Amendment, the ACLU sided with business groups and parted ways from the labor movement and from New Deal administrators. And second, the decision to do so nearly tore the ACLU uh, apart. It was a profound crisis for uh, the ACLU. Still, I want to emphasize that this was not simply a matter of the ACLU abandoning its original goals. Uh, rather, the ACLU felt that protecting business speech, even when it seemed more economic than expressive, was the only way to ensure that picketing and boycotts would be protected too. So for a brief time, it seemed that that gambit might work. The first Supreme Court case to explicitly invoke the reasoning of footnote four of Caroline Products was a 1940 uh, case called Thornhill v. Alabama. And in it, the court announced a First Amendment right to picket on the theory that picketing communicated political and economic ideas. Uh, this was a bold move, right, for the court. Uh, and its significance was not lost on contemporaries. In 1940, uh, a labor scholar named Charles Gregory, Gregory published uh, an article in the ABA journal fretting uh, that to fit what he called economic compulsion within the ambit of the First Amendment was a perversion of an American ideal. And sounding here strangely like contemporary critics of Citizens United, uh, Gregory reflected, and I'm going to read a, a, a long quote here, for years the old court was under fire because its doctrine of substantive due process developed to make possible the invalidation of local legislative experiments. It now seems from the picketing cases of last spring that the new court is perpetuating this error by using the 14th Amendment to establish its conception of the guarantees of liberty set forth in the First Amendment. Gregory, in other words, was lamenting the Lochnerization of the First Amendment, what he saw as the distortion of a constitutional ideal in the service of unsettling government efforts to regulate labor relations. And in the face of criticism like Gregory's, the Supreme Court quickly whittled away at constitutional protection, protection for picketing. Within a decade, virtually everything the interwar ACLU had accomplished to afford protection to labor speech was undone. As the, as the dissenting justices uh, observed in a 1957 case upholding an anti-picketing uh, injunction, 
the court had declared, as they put it, a formal surrender from its First Amendment protection of labor speech. But by then, of course, the First Amendment served other ends, even from the perspective of the ACLU. A 1941 annual report announced that the ACLU's battleground was chiefly in the courts. Its volunteer attorneys had carried scores of civil liberties issues to the United States Supreme Court, where decisions in case after case had firmly established the interpretations of the Bill of Rights, which the union supported. And the ACLU never again retreated from its support for judicial enforcement of the First Amendment. Okay, so where does all this history leave us? So for many years, scholars and pundits took it on faith that the ACLU got it right, that a strong First Amendment would preserve a platform for transformative political ideas. The dominant understanding of the First Amendment during this period was infused with an aspirational commitment to participatory democracy, minority rights, and peaceful social change. For a generation who came of age with McCarthyism and the Civil Rights Movement, the First Amendment was what protected peaceful democratic protest from a potentially repressive state. In the hands of the Warren Court, civil liberties protected soapbox orators, civil rights marchers, and anti-war protesters. America's commitment to free speech began, became one of the nation's most cherished values and one that was exported with pride to aspiring constitutional democracies throughout the world. But as I suggested in the introduction, that rosy assessment has recently changed. For the first time in decades, there's a real debate today, not only about the limits of the First Amendment, but over the extent to which the judiciary should be calling the shots. Now, I'm not going to pretend here that history can tell us how to proceed, uh, but whatever one's views, I do think it's crucial to understand that the modern First Amendment uh, was, uh, it, sorry, what the modern First Amendment was intended to achieve and what it accomplished in fact. It's worth observing here that there has been very little progress in extending First Amendment protection to the early ACLU's guiding ambition, the right to strike. But last spring, the refusal of public sector employees to contribute to union expenses very nearly became a First Amendment freedom. Citizens United is just one of many First Amendment victories for corporations uh, at a time when, according to, to Hillary uh, Clinton, uh, the Supreme Court is especially, uh, is especially inclined to hear a case if the US Chamber of Commerce is the petitioner, citing a uh, study there. Uh, and Clinton may consider that trend to be a departure from the court's historic commitment to uh, what she called uh, in our opening quote, the little guy, but that's a hard interpretation to square with history. Certainly the court's current direction would not have surprised the chamber's 1937 membership, which was advised at uh, its 1937 annual meeting to guard against the destruction of civil liberties, I'm quoting here, because freedom of enterprise and personal freedom are but expressions of one and the same thing. Hillary Clinton has pledged uh, that if she's elected, she will introduce a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United. And the ACLU has declared its firm opposition to any proposed amendment that will limit the speech clause uh, of this First Amendment. And for the past few months, the editorial pages have been packed with cautionary pieces warning about the dire implications of retreating from the most uh, speech protective version of the First Amendment. And there are, of course, strong arguments of, on both sides of this debate, as there were in the 1930s. But I think there's one thing that we should all agree on, namely that there is nothing new about Clinton's accusation that the Roberts Court is, as she put it, stacking the deck in favor of the already wealthy. After all, it was almost 80 years ago that a group of disillusioned lawyers broke ranks with the civil liberties movement and sought a constitutional amendment to, to limit judicial review. What they said was this, there can be no true enforcement of the Bill of Rights 
in the interests of persons instead of wealth, except by the elected representatives of the people. And with that, uh, I'd be very happy to take questions. If I could invite uh, anyone who'd like to ask a question to please come to the microphones on the side. Uh, Yes, hi. Um, very good presentation. Thank you. A question about the ACLU, because they play a major role in all of this. How are they funded, and do they enjoy tax-free status? Are you speaking uh, about during this historical period or today? Well, in general, the historical period and today. Um, so uh, the ACLU was funded primarily um, from contributions. It actually uh, in 1929 changed its status uh, to a corporation so that it could re receive bequests. But it was, it was uh, uh, funded, uh, well, I should say, uh, at first it was funded by uh, largely um, uh, uh, some, some uh, it had one very wealthy board member who funded a lot of its activities. Uh, and increasingly it began to rely on smaller contributions. Um, obviously that uh, they took a, a big hit uh, with the um, Great Depression, um, and to some extent, it may be that their need to bring in a broader uh, range of uh, contributions uh, influenced its agenda. Um, it, it tried to make itself uh, uh, sort of more more appealing to a broader audience during that uh, during that period. Um, I, uh, I I don't want to speak to the <laughs> to its to its status today because I, I don't want to get that uh, to make an error. Do you know if they enjoy tax-free status? Uh, well, as d does anyone know that? Um, I don't know. Um, My contributions are not tax deductible. They're not tax deductible. Okay. Because they, what they all do, they all have, they all set up uh, foundations, foundations that meet the five hundred one c three criteria. But because the ACLU lobbies, that's that's different. That's a little. Ordinarily, legal defense organizations, so, you know, for example, with the NAACP, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund uh, is separate and is tax exempt, whereas the lobbying organization is not. I don't know how the ACLU manages that. Uh, yeah. Yes, could I ask you to? If someone calls up the ACLU and or uh, the NAACP and says, uh, I'm in jail for, or I've been arrested on, on a free speech issue, um, and the lawyer is sent to assist that person, that, uh, the expense of that enterprise uh, is covered by the organization and then contributions to cover that expense are tax exempt. Is that correct? <laughs> it seems reasonable <laughs> to I'm, me. I, I, I'm just going to have to apologize and say I am uh, by no means an expert on the uh, ACLU's <laughs> tax status. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, thanks very much for your presentation. The, uh, the last statement you made uh, that you really can't depend on the court, it's always going to be in the hands of the wealthy, is the Warren Court an exception to that? Is that the, uh, I mean, it might, it maybe the real question is, uh, it'll be the ballot box, but it'll be the ballot box that determines the composition of the court that uh, determines that, which makes 
uh, which makes today the current election pretty important in that respect. Okay, so uh, great. A couple of things to say about that. First, I want to clarify that that was uh, that I was not articulating my view there. I, I, I was drawing attention to the fact that this debate that we're having now about amending the Constitution in the context of, of Citizens United is one uh, that resembles very closely uh, a, a debate over uh, amending the Constitution in the 1930s, and that many of the same objections were raised. As to the question of whether the Warren Court was an exception, um, to some extent they were. Um, as you may know, the, the, the Warren Court resisted uh, what a lot of uh, poverty lawyers were trying to do at the time, which was to make wealth itself a suspect classification um, under the, the, uh, you know, the constitutional um, uh, framework that I've uh, explained with respect uh, to, to Caroline products, which would have um, uh, allowed them to take on a sort of more um, uh, interventionist, redistributive uh, uh, approach. Um, but uh, you're right to say that uh, the Warren Court was certainly uh, attentive to the ways in which uh, money influenced uh, politics uh, and was also more willing to check uh, the rights of, uh, for example, uh, commercial speech. Um, there was a sort of uh, break from the end of uh, the period I discussed uh, until the 70s uh, or 80s. Um, you know, it's interesting that you raise the question of judicial appointments because, of course, that too, and it's not something I could talk about today, but that too was a uh, very salient issue during the 1930s. That's, uh, of course, what fueled the court packing plan uh, was this idea that you had to uh, think about who it was that was going to be on the court, uh, that there were various ways to influence what the court did one of them uh, was to change uh, the court's mandate, either uh, through the Constitution or legislatively, but another one was through the appointment process. And in fact, one of President Roosevelt's uh, close advisors, who also happened to be general counsel for the ACLU, uh, said just that, that basically we have to get over this idea that there's a good judge or there's a bad judge. There is only what he ca called uh, a judge of our economic views or of someone else's. Um, and uh, last thing I'll say about that is that uh, uh, that was also the impulse behind the judicial recall. So I, I mentioned um, uh, Teddy Roosevelt and the recall of judicial uh, opinions. During the progressive era, the biggest solution that was offered to try to solve this problem of uh, judges being, as they saw it, beholden to corporate interests uh, was to make the judges themselves democratically accountable uh, and in particular to make them susceptible to recall in the event uh, by, by popular majorities in the event that their decisions undermined the public, uh, uh, the public welfare or, or public uh, opinion.